and uh, I think uh, Amandine wants to be made the co-host again. Can you do that? So she can also record the session. Who? Uh, Amandine wants I to be- I think she is already a co-host. Uh, okay, okay. She's already a co-host, uh, so she should be able to. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I disconnected and reconnected. Let's be here. <laughs> Okay, I think the recording has started. Okay. Yeah, in fact, she was disconnected and she don't have, she is not host anymore. No. Okay, let me try this again. I will try to. Okay, thanks. Uh, make her first pause. Yeah, that's okay. Perfect, thanks. So, hello, everybody. Thanks for attending this online presentation. So, I'm Guillaume Sartou, and with my colleague uh, Amandine Maima, Guillaume Bison, Fanny Teja, and Yanni Kriou. We are going to present an introduction on human-robot interaction. As I already said, if you have any question uh, during the presentation, do not hesitate to ask them in the, in the chat. Uh, we will answer them either in the chat during the presentation or at the end of the presentation. Uh, let us start with a general context on human-robot interaction before seeing how we can implement it into robots. Before seeing how we can make robots interactive with interacting with humans, let's take a look at and the company tend to sell us about our future. And being in the same environment as the robots and near to them. However, let's take a look, look at the current freeze. The robots are assigned to specific tasks and are designed to be the most efficient to achieve this task. Since they, are not they don't take into account the element of their environments that are not part of the task as the presence of humans, they are currently assigned to dedicated area, preventing humans to be in contact with them. We can also take a simple example that some of you uh, can already have at home, the cleaning robot. If you try to put a glass uh, on it to bring it uh, to another location, or if you put your cart on your robot, uh, does the robot will act differently? The answer is no. In fact, in the, same way, uh, in the same way, the robot does not consider you as a human being, but rather as an obstacle, exactly like a table leg. This means that the robot will not hurt you. However, it will not try to not disturb you. For example, if you are cooking in your kitchen and the robot is cleaning it, you will, not have to, you, you will have to avoid it, avoid it and not the inverse. Finally, we have to speak about Boston Dynamics because they are so famous. Uh, their robot seems to be the most advanced ones with amazing movement and being able to dance. However, I challenged you to go dancing with them. They execute pre-computed, in fact, movement, and even if they manage their balance, they will, not, uh, they will do the same movement if you're there or not. This means that they are not designed to be in contact with humans. So our goal here is to go from robots that act for humans, uh, but in separate uh, environments, uh, like uh, Guillaume just showed you, uh, to robots acting with humans. Uh, here, the, the, the problem is not only to uh, have a robot uh, knowing its environment and its uh, and its own uh, embodiment, let's say, but also to model the human, uh, model the human in order to create to create a synergy in order to make collaborative tasks. So how how can we do this? First, uh, we want the robot to integrate human humans models. Um, 
and we and uh, we will present them later in the in the presentation. Uh, but what 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 is the human models? In fact, we inspire a lot from psychology and philosophy, uh, whose role are to design such human models. But if we look around, we see that uh, human already acts with autonomous agents, uh, being other humans. So we can just say, but let's put uh, a human as a robot. Let's let's make uh, our robot a copy of a human. We claim that is not a good, uh, this is not a good choice. Indeed, uh, what if your uh, computer, uh, when you give uh, when you give it a, a, a small computation to do, uh, take like a human ten seconds to do it and uh, and fail to carry the one. Uh, so we claim that uh, co copying the human is not the solution. We want something to uh, collaborate with the human, to be used by the human, but not to copy the human. So uh, we want a robot which adapts to humans and not one, one imitating them. So we studied uh, what is needed for, uh, for humans to collaborate together. And uh, with this information, we can build a robot uh, that will be a good collaborator for the human. So we need a robot with cognitive representations uh, that knows that humans have cognitive representations. Um, so uh, we know that when collaborating, humans share knowledge, such as the vocabulary, uh, the effects of action. So if the robot uh, puts something on the table, it will know that uh, the effect is uh, the object is on the table. Um, uh, they have the knowledge of uh, shared knowledge of the object in the environment. So if uh, the robot uh, see an object, uh, it will be able to, to compute if the human is able to see the same uh, object or not. Um, the procedure, how to do a particular task, and also uh, the social norms, uh, how the robot uh, should behave or how the humans um, expect that the robots behave. So for example, if the robot talks to the human without uh, looking at them, uh, it would be weird for them. So uh, a social norm, norm can be the robot should look at the human when uh, talking to them. Um, and uh, they share a goal, so they can agree on the goal uh, uh, they should do, and uh, then uh, share, the, share a plan. Uh, to, do, to execute the plan, they uh, share, uh, they uh, monitor each other, uh, the position, the actions, and the beliefs. So uh, we have uh, this representation that show, uh, show how uh, partners in a task uh, can uh, have uh, their representations. So I'm going to talk to you about the implementation that we done on our robot. So so this is an overview of the architecture. I'm going to briefly present you step by step. Then in the second phase, you will have a more detailed presentation of each component, except the natural language processing that is not our field of expertise. Uh, we just use it out of the box. The architecture takes inspiration of the previous works of our thesis supervisor, Rashid Alami. All the components, as you can see, are inter interacting with each other. We could even say they are really they rely on each other and they are interdependent. I'm going to start with the highest level component of the architecture, what we call the supervision. We say it is the highest level component as it receives its information from all the other components, take decision and make the robot execute them. It decides what is the current goal, sometimes negotiated with the human partner through dialogue. Once it has a goal, it gets a plan for, um, for, uh, from the planner uh, that we can see in green. Then it executes the plan, that is to say that the robot executes its allocated action from the plan thanks to the motion planners in yellow and monitors the ones allocated to the human to know where they are in the plan. If something unexpected happens, an error, it can try to communicate with the human and or uh, get a new plan. All the decisions are taken based on its knowledge and perception of the environment and of the human. The knowledge comes either from the supervision itself or the knowledge bases in red. 
the symbolic planners are divided into two categories, the domain independent plan, uh, planning high level task and the domain dependent in solving precise problems. Here, symbolic means that the world, the data on which we base ourselves uh, are, um, are facts. We represent a fact as a triplet, that is to say uh, a verb as to say A fact can be true or false. Okay, so now what about the planners? The human world task planner generates what we call shared plans, which are plans with some actions allocated to the human and others allocated to the robot. To generate a plan, it bases itself on the current state of the world stored in the knowledge basis. The referring expression generator is a specific planner that gives to the supervision the needed noun and adjectives to talk about an object, to distinguish it among other objects. For example, to talk about a given pen, should the robot say the pen or the blue pen on the table? Uh, the referring expression generator uh, give uh, this information to the supervision. It also bases itself on the current state of the world. We use two kinds of motion planners and the executor. The one for the manipulation, controlling the robot arms, and the one to navigate, controlling the robot base. When the supervision needs the robot to act, it asks them to plan their motion. If they manage to do it, then they execute the plan they just completed. If something does not work in the planning phase or the execution phase, they send a feedback to the supervision, informing it uh, of the issue. With this information, the supervision can try to ask for a replan of the motion and a new execution or ask the human to help, for example, to remove an object which might be blocking uh, the robot or preventing it to succeed the motion execution. If the new plan or the human help are not enough, the supervision might abort the task or continue it without the wanted motion. Now let's talk about the lowest level of the architecture, the, the sensory motor layer. It is connected to all the sensors and motors of the robot. When it receives a request of motion, the drivers of the robot handle it. On the perception part, currently we use 2D markers, kind of a QR codes to recognize objects and motion capture to perceive the human. A person interacting with the robot has to put a helmet with reflective markers on it and uh, also uh, on its head, on their hand. This perception data are sent to the situation assessment component. The situation assessment component handles the geometric data from perception, integrating them to its geometric model of the environment, which is created offline. It transforms the geometric data, for example, the mug, the mug has coordinate, coordinates x equals zero, y equal one, and z equal one, the table has also other coordinates, uh, and from these coordinates, uh, it computes symbolic data such as the mug is on the table. It also computes the perspective of the human, generating, for example, the human is able to see the mug uh, blue. Geometric data are sent to the motion planners, uh, as they need precise positions of the entities. The symbolic facts uh, feed uh, the, the knowledge basis. Uh, and finally, the symbolic facts generated by the situation assessment, as I just said, are sent to the knowledge basis, representing both the robot's knowledge and the human's estimating ones. We distinguish two kinds of knowledge bases, the semantic knowledge base and the episodic knowledge base. The semantic one contains the facts fed offline, such as a table is a sport, and the, the episodic one contains all the facts generated of, uh, online, coming from the situation assessment or deduced by the component itself. Um, so we have seen an overview of the architecture. Now we are going to present you uh, with more details, each component uh, one by one, starting with the knowledge base. So, uh... used by robots not interactive with humans. In the following, we will just present you how we really take into account the human 
at each level of the architecture. We start with the estimation of the human knowledge about the current situation. To represent the robot knowledge, we use what we call an ontology. We can define the hierarchy of uh, the general concepts, like the fact that the robot and that robots and humans are called kind of agents, or the fact that a table is a kind of support. We can also define the hierarchy of the type of the properties, like that the property is above is a kind of, sim of geometric pro property that we can refine it to its own, which express a contact. Uh, with, with the support. On the basis of this definition, we can then instantiate the general concepts to represent entity of the environments, like that cube 42 is an instance of the concept cube, and use the property uh, is on to describe the, the relation. Uh, and we also use properties, in fact, to describe relation between entities, like the fact that fact that cube 42 is on table one. In such a way, in, in this way, uh, with this way uh, to organize the knowledge by, it is such a way <laughs> to organize the knowledge by creating a knowledge graph with a hierarchy of types and property. An, ad an advantage of such representation is that, that it is human understandable and that it aims to representing the way uh, we represent our own knowledge. Thanks to this characteristic, we use uh, exactly this kind of pre knowledge representation, both for the robots and for an estimation of the human uh, partner's knowledge. Now we can we know that we can represent this knowledge as well as estimating uh, its partner's one we, uh, the robot need to be able to update them. To do so, the robot has to perceive and understand its environment. This is what we call assessing the situation. With our situation assessment component, we use tags to perceive the object and motion capture to perceive the humans. The information coming from, uh, from these perception modalities often merge with static entities and the robot model to create a geometric representation of the environment. On the created model, we then perform geometric reasoning process. For example, if the robot uh, no more perceives an object, we have to understand why this object is no more per perceived. It can be because it is out of the field of view of the camera, or because the tag is hidden, or just because it has been removed by a, human, by a human. Since the robot knows the position of the head of the human uh, and has a geometric representation of its environment, it can thus estimate the human uh, what the human perceives on, on this environment. To do so, we put a virtual uh, camera at the position of the head of the human head, and we create uh, a geometric representation, an estimation of what the human can perceive in fact, and thus we create a geometric rep representation for the human. The previously created geometric representation are then used to compute symbolic facts, like that the box is, is on the table or that a given cube is in the box. These facts are then sent to the knowledge base in the form of, of semantic relations to keep uh, continuously to continuously keep the knowledge base up to date. This means that this process is done both for the robot and on the estimation of uh, the knowledge partner, of the knowledge of the human partners. Uh, in the current example, at your left, you have the real situation, and on your right, you have the geometric representation estimated by the robot for its partner. You can see that the left top block is not present in the estimation of the human representation, as the robot has estimated that the human cannot see this block. Consequently, uh, in the human estimated knowledge base, the same block will not be described as being in the box.
So um, based on what Guillaume just said on how we organize and then deduce and update knowledge, uh, we can then create uh, domain-specific symbolic planners, uh, allowing to express and to communicate this knowledge. Uh, to do so, uh, I will present you uh, two, two specific, uh, well, two domain-specific domains. Uh, for the first one uh, aims at uh, referring objects in the environment. So uh, let's take again the example uh, with the blocks and the boxes. Uh, so, uh, if we need the robot to be able to designate a given block to its human partner, let's say uh, the one uh, circled in red uh, in, on, the, on the picture on the right, uh, if we consider uh, what, uh, what Guillaume uh, just uh, has introduced previously, the robot knows that they don't have the same knowledge about the current situation. To communicate about an entity uh, of a given situation, so we use what is called referring expression generation. Because we want to communicate information to the human, this planner is run on the human's estimated knowledge base. As Guillaume showed, we have two knowledge bases, one for the robot and one for the human, one for, the, well, one for each uh, human's uh, estimated knowledge. So we run on the human estimated ones. Um, by doing so, we only communicate about entities where the, the robot estimates the human knows. So doing so, and doing so as a second advantage, being that uh, we estimate him to not know uh that to yeah sorry um the second advantage is uh we estimate him to not know uh not to be considered as being able to impact his understanding of communication the goal of the referring expression generation is to find the minimal set of relations to communicate uh, which allows the human to, to identify a given entity for example to ref for for the robot to refer to the circle block on the right with the perspective the robot has uh, the robot could, uh, would compute that it can only say the blue block. Um, indeed, in its estimation of the, uh, of the human knowledge, the block on the top, uh, which is pointed by the red arrow on the image on the right, is not known by the human which is in the, who is in, on the other side of the, of the shelf. Um, however, uh, uh, on, on, his, on his own because if you look at the human's perspective on the left, uh, there is a, another blue uh, block uh, which is also pointed by an arrow, but then the human has to uh, estimate that the robot does not know this, uh, this block and so is referring to the circle, to the circle one. Uh, I will let Guillaume explain how we implemented uh, this uh, another domain-specific communication uh, platform. Well, the second example of communication about estimation consists of a robot having to explain a route to follow to a human. Consider a robot being at the location with the start flag in red. Its goal is to explain to human how to reach the, the door at the right of the image. At the defense of the previous example, the robot cannot estimate what is visible by, by the human as the door is out of, the, of view and can either estimate what the human already knows about the building. In this example, the robot will use communication, taking into account an estimation of the future visibility of the human and an estimation of his future actions in the environment. A possible example to reach the door will be go through this corridor, imagine that the robot is pointing to the initial direction to take, and turn right at the very end, then take the door uh, at your left. In such an explanation, when the robot say turn right or at your left, it does not speak about the right and the left of the human have to act and move in the, build in the building. In such, uh, in such a project, uh, it's such project itself along the path to estimate the location of elements along the past at the future location of the, of the human. Next, uh, we move on to the, how the robot accounts for the human motions and moves in a human environment. So, uh, the robot moving in a human environment like this uh, needs to estimate the possible motion of the human, like how will we, how will the human move in the vicinity, and also 
uh, how will he react uh, to the actions of the robot to complete the navigation finally. So on the top of this, the robot also needs to obey certain social norms that are prevalent in the society. This increases the legibility of the robot motion and also increases the acceptability by humans. So now we'll proceed to how we do it. So I'll briefly give a small description of robot navigation and how it works. So as we can see from the simple figure, once the navigation goal is received by the system, it first does the path planning, followed by the trajectory planning, and finally computes the command velocity that is sent to the robot. Now, if, if we expand it, this is how it looks like. After the path planning is completed, the control loop takes over and tries to follow the planned path, avoiding the obstacles. This involves the planning of the trajectory based on the updated odometry, old information, and all the information that is needed uh, to compute the next command velocity. Now, the path planning is not uh, replanned every instant or every second, but it is replanned only if it is not valid in some sense of uh, validation. Now, let's see how this changes with the humans in the loop. Here, the system has to know the whereabouts of the humans along with the navigation goal. So this can be provided by, like you can see in the figure, like we have to provide the goal as well as the human separately. And the human tracking can be provided using motion capture, as we said earlier. Also using a tracking system mounted on the camera, which can be used for outdoors. Once we have the required information, we can now use the human prediction system to predict how a human might move. However, this is not, really easy because humans are not entirely predictable always and they can do whatever they prefer to do in the environment. Okay, so now after coming up with some approximate human prediction, how can we use this? Or precisely, should it be a part of the path planning or trajectory planning? So the answer can be different and based on different situations. So for example, in this work by Colmitz and et al, like they have used a, a path planning uh, they have tried to in include the human prediction system into path planning uh, with a simple controller which follows the path. By including a constant velocity prediction, they reduce the unnecessary path deviations caused by the continuous planning and replanning. So now it could also be a part of uh, trajectory prediction, sorry, trajectory planning. Now in a more recent work by Chan et al, the human prediction is used as a part of trajectory planning assess the situation and to take a appropriate command velocity to the robot and send a appropriate command velocity to the robot. Usually this setting is more advantageous because it's more reactive and also um, more cooperative uh, for a human setting. So now, uh, okay. Okay, now coming to our methodology, we do something different. Like we do, prediction based on planning. So we do the planning for the human along with the robot, assuming that the human might follow all the social norms and does not collide with the robot. With this assumption, we try to plan for the human. Now, what is the advantage of this kind of system? So now we have two things, like we still have the approximate prediction, which we discussed earlier, but also something extra, which is a possible plan for the human, which if followed will lead to the successful navigation of both robot and the human. This type of elicitation of solution is helpful when you are in a very complex navigation scenario where you, you might need a robot to act first and then you provide a solution to the human. So, sorry, consider the example shown here. So the robot and the human have to cross each other in a corridor. The goal of the robot is on the left end, but we do not know the goal of the human. Therefore, we also need a goal prediction system for example, uh, what would be the possible goal in the system? So in this scenario, for example, the goal could be on the other end of the corridor. Likewise, we can uh, predict goals in the environment based on places of interest, like maybe door, office, or some uh, a corridor where the human needs to go, or place uh, the objects of interest, like maybe a table or the dustbin, or some TV, whichever is in the environment. So with all this, we can now finally plan for both human and the robot, like shown in this figure, and then we can get the command velocity for the robot. So,
attain the goals and for the The hyper uh, shown in this graph between each node, I mean, the circles are the nodes. So between each node, we have this uh, different constraints which are represented, uh, represented as edges. So between each robot node, we have the kinodynamic uh, constraints for the robot, like velocity, acceleration, et cetera. And this is it's also a place for between human nodes. And between human and the robot nodes, we have the social constraints like uh, maintain its proper distance from human, do not arrive, surprise the human, or um, maintain safe velocity around the human, et cetera. So now once this graph is built, we do a, uh, so these are the different constraints we highlight. And then once this graph is built, we do a sparse optimization on this graph to finally obtain the trajectory, which is shown on the right. So once the trajectory is obtained, we compute the current uh, command velocity that is sent to the robot to have a legible Q robot motion. So here are some examples of uh, the results in the scenario. So I think I'll play the first one. Uh, okay, yeah. So here is a door crossing scenario on your left with the proactive planning, the scheme uh, we described, the robot was able to predict a possible human position and also clear the way for the human and and also waited for the human until he crossed. And on the right, we have the corridor scenario, which we described earlier. So in this case, the robot uh, clears the way for the human and uh, pr proceeds to one side of the corridor to uh, say that you say that the preference to take a preference and you clear way for the human. So yeah, so now we try to show them examples in real life with this scenario. So this is a corridor scenario again. So the, the robot kind of moves a sideways to give way for the human and the human also cooperates to finally complete the navigation. So next we present a two human scenario where we have two humans trying to go along with the human or uh, along with the robot. And the, and the robot has to change the plan in between because the other human decides to go on the, uh, on the left side of the robot. So now there's one more scenario, the door crossing scenario, which we described earlier. So you can see that the robot adapts and does not block the human's path and just uh, takes an alternative path, which does not block the human. Now, until now, we have seen simple scenarios or like, uh, pretty cooperative human and all. So what if we have some non-cooperative human? What if we have uh, some non-ideal scenarios? For example, what if the human blocks the robot's path? So you can see in this example, the human does not really cooperate and just comes in front of the robot and blocks the robot's navigation. So the robot then tries to follow the same path, but it's confused that whether it should go on the same path because it will be too close to the human and the, it thinks still the human ha, is still going to move, but then we have updated the system a bit, which kind of gives us the idea that uh, the robot, the, the human is not moving anymore. So I think you don't need to plan. So the robot kind of tries to plan for the human for a while and then moves on to stop planning and then uh, carry on to its goal. Now this, the, now this is one of the scenarios and we, In this scenario, I mean, there can be numerous solutions like the human can go back or the robot can move back. But since we are currently working on robot navigation, so we try the robot to go back and clear the way for the human. So like the robot tries to go, but it sees that the human blocked the way. So it kind of backs off slowly and then waits on the, it's for the human until the human crosses the pathway. So, So now we will speak um, more about motion planning and execution, uh, which is the manipulation part of the of this of this module. 
so um, we will begin with uh, an example uh, because motion planning around the human is a difficult task. And we will see uh, this uh, on, on this three video. Uh, because human and robots have, uh, can have a different rhythm. Uh, so uh, you can see this on the on the video from uh, the the movie uh, Modern Time from uh, Charlie Chaplin. Uh, here you can see that the robot isn't uh, the robot uh, have his own rhythm and the human must comply. So the um, the, the robot isn't compliant at all and the human must comply. Uh, on the second video in the middle, we can see a robot handling uh, over a bottle to the, to the human. The human tries to take the bottle before the robot reach its own goal position and the robot uh, doesn't comply and continue uh, to its uh, goal position. So we can see that the human tried to take the bottle. And on the third video, we can see that the robot is more compliant because uh, it wants to go to uh, its goal position and stops when the human uh, takes the bottle. So it, it seems more natural and also is the, the interaction with the, the human. So for now, the motion planning, the motion planning node that we developed uh, doesn't integrate this compliance but we have made some research on compliance on robot-robot uh, uh, manipulation uh, on Panda robots. Uh, yeah, so, um, so we we based our motion planning node on Movid framework that you might know. Uh, so it's a ROS package, uh, ROS standing for Robot Operating System. Uh, it is widely used for robot manipulation, like pick and place tasks. So we will see uh, quickly how Movit is organized. So Movit framework contains different useful components gathered around the main move group uh, node. The planning scene uh, that we can see on the right is used to keep track of the robot's environment, like object furniture, but also the robot state. Uh, it can be fed by an external perception node and the robot will be able to interact with the object in the environment. Uh, the planning requests are handled by the planning pipeline, which checks for collision detection and use a planning interface to access to planners. Uh, the planning pipeline then uh, generates uh, a tra trajectory uh, composed of waypoints uh, that will be uh, then executed by the, by the robot. Um, the planning interface uh, of Movit use OMPL uh, that you also might know, uh, which means Open Motion Planning Library, and it gives uh, the ability to load and change planner at runtime. Uh, on the left, we can see Trajectory Execution Manager, which does the bridge between Movit and the low-level robot controller. So it takes uh, the tra trajectory waypoints generated and it feeds them to the low-level robot controller and that will do the, the real, uh, the, the movement of the robot. Uh, to account to the few flows of MoveIt, uh, which are uh, the um, uh, difficult debugging and um, we also can't really see where the planning uh, failed. Uh, we used, uh, the movie task constructor framework. Um, so it gives the ability to see which part of the, of the task that we are building uh, is failing and why. Uh, and also it is the creation of more complex tasks uh, by dividing them into simple steps, like uh, to take an object, you need to approach the object, open the gripper, go to the peak pose, close the gripper, leave the object, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So as you can see on the, the video on the right, um, you, you can see the, the, simula the, the virtual environment in green uh, and the robot executing the tasks. And on the right, you can see the, 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 
Movit Task Constructor plugin in Arvis uh, that uh, gives uh, all the simple steps that I uh, talked before uh, for the peak uh, for the peak task, and uh, you can click on every single step to see uh, to see which one uh, has um, has failed, and also uh, you you can. Uh, you you can see what is causing the the error that you that you have. Uh, why can't I? Uh, yeah. So now that we see uh, move it and move it as constructor, uh, we will see the motion planning node that we developed around uh, these two framework. Um, so it provides planning and execution capabilities for pick and place but also arm movement tasks. So as we said before, this, the, the manipulation nodes uh, need is to be used along with the supervisor. Uh, it will wait to receive a plan command containing the action to be performed, like a peak, a place, or a movement. Then it will update the movie planning scene uh, to be able to check for collision, but also to know the object uh, we might be interacting with. So this is done by asking the knowledge base uh, about the meshes and of the object and their ID. To get the poses of the object in the scene, we will ask the situation assessment, which keeps tr a track of what the robot saw through its Kinect camera sensor. Um, after that, the task will be constructed using Movie Task Constructor Framework. And in the end, uh, the task will be planned and multiple solutions will be found and uh, for each one, a trajectory will be uh, generated. Uh, and when an execution request is received, uh, it will recall uh, the last plan task, check, check if it had uh, valid solutions, and take the one with the least cost, and then execute, execute it. Uh, so you can also see on the diagram that feedbacks and results are returned for each request. Uh, this is to be able to know the status of the task planning or execution at uh, any time. And it also is uh, the beginning process. So here is an example of uh, a pick and place uh, using uh, these two frameworks. And I think I will pass. So after we, so now we have seen the motion planning part, uh, where the um, so where the robot has to uh, compute and plan for its motion. Uh, as well, uh, while taking uh, account for the human. Now we will see um, uh, symbolic planning. So a few words about symbolic planning. As Amandine said earlier, uh, symbolic planning, uh, uh, in symbolic planning, sorry, we have uh, the word state represented with a set of facts of freedoms. Uh, then given an initial word state and a goal word state, as well as a set of actions able to change this word state, uh, symbolic planning aims at computing a plan constituted of sequences of uh, sequence of actions to reach the, the specified goal. However, uh, if we consider the human, the human can also act. So we have to consider uh, them during the, the planning process. Uh, moreover, the robot can have all the human also have the ability to create a shared goal, uh, leading to shared plans. So while accounting for both agent actions. Uh, but uh, the, the planning, well, at, at the result of the planning process, we can control the robot. Uh, but it's not the case with humans. If we want, if we want to have a chance for a human to do something the planner wants to, uh, we have to make communication actions. But sometimes communication either are not possible or costly because maybe the environment is noisy and so on. Uh, but still, the human actions can be predictable but not fully controllable. 
uh, to do so, uh, we chose to, to use hierarchical task network planning. So a few words about uh, classical hierarchical task network planning. So it aims at recursively selecting a decomposition for high level abstract tasks until they are all resolved as applicable primitive tasks or actions. So actually you put uh, uh, your expert knowledge about how you want the robot to be able to do the task and then the robot has just to choose between several uh, possibilities to, to perform a task until uh, it plans that the possibility can be done. And so, may uh, what is funny? at uh, representing human activities as hierarchical tasks. Here you see, for example, the interaction with um, uh, a system called uh, the, the KCCU uh, and how the human can uh, act, uh, interact with it, uh, starting uh, at the top from abstract tasks uh, until there is the bottom uh, task, uh, which are actions and motor actions in that case. I will not explain how our uh, algorithm and planning process works, but I will show you how uh, what it can what it can do. The water machine, the, the sorry, the coffee machine must be filled with water, which can be uh, uh, retrieved at the sink. Uh, so first, let's uh, forget about the human for a bit and uh, just uh, see how uh, uh, well with classical HTM network we can uh, solve this task. So we are able to make a, a hierarchical task network and to plan for this specific initial world state, uh, leading to this plan. Uh, where first the robot will get, will get water to do the thing, then, then put it in the coffee machine. Then the robot will get uh, coffee to the kitchen cupboard and put it in the coffee machine, and the coffee will be uh, ready to be served. Uh, however, now uh, the robot detects that a human is nearby and maybe will compute that uh, asking for human help will be uh, uh, more efficient in uh, accomplishing the task. So the, uh, we so we model that the human can do this, and we model the robot uh, also can do this, and so the robot can now plan that uh, first at the left uh, you see the robot asks the human, uh, can you can you help me to make coffee? Then two situations happens. We so we model that the human knows how to make coffee, but it can do it in two ways. Uh, it can either go and uh, search for coffee ground or uh, go and get uh, uh, water for the coffee machine, uh, giving us a conditional plan. Uh, and you see it branches, uh, one, one branch is on the top and one branch is on the bottom. Uh, in either case, uh, the robot will, well, the robot plans to adapt to the human actions by uh, completing the actions, by either uh, going to get water if the human uh, uh, has, uh, already has a coffee, uh, coffee ground, or, uh, or getting coffee ground if the human uh, already has water. However, uh, we saw that uh, sometimes, and actually the majority of times, uh, beliefs are not al aligned. Uh, there are differences between beliefs of the robot, what the robot knows about the world state, and what the and what the robot estimates the human know about the about the world. For example, here we depicted a situation where uh, the robot uh, knows there is no coffee in the kitchen cupboard but only in the pantry cupboard. However, the robot estimates that the, the, the human thinks there is coffee in the, in the, in the kitchen cupboard. Uh, so uh, if, the, if we just uh, execute the plan before, the robot can, can plan that uh, the human uh, will first get coffee at the kitchen cupboard, which is the closest to, to them, uh, find that there is none, and then go to the pantry cupboard. However, we can also endow, uh, endow our robot with the ability to update the human, uh, the human world state via a communication action uh, on which we can estimate its cost. Um, and then first, you see at uh, the top left uh, picture, the robot will ask for the human to help. 
but uh, say that uh, watch out uh, human there is no coffee in the in the kitchen cupboard updating the belief as you see in the, in the bottom row uh, on the left and so the human will directly go to take coffee at the pantry cupboard without uh, mistaking and go to the kitchen cupboard uh, however, with a plan uh, like this, uh, well, a plan has no point if it's not executed. So uh, I will let Amandine uh, talk about the supervision. So how to manage uh, the interactions uh, based on uh, using all the components that uh, we've seen before. Uh, so we want to endow the robot with the abilities to control and evaluate its contribution to human robot joint action. Um, so uh, the, supervision, the supervision system is, uh, use, is based on uh, all the other components to uh, get a plan, then e execute it. Uh, but it's not uh, only uh, follow the different step of the plan, it has to be aware and analyze uh, everything that is happening in the environment to make the right decision at the right time. Uh, so for example, if it has to give a cube to a human, which is in the plan, but the human is not here, uh, the robot has to make the decision to not give the cube yet to the human and wait uh, that the human come back, which is not in the plan. Uh, it has uh, to handle also uh, all the contingencies that can happen. So um, what I just give as an example is a sort of contingency, but it can also be, uh, for example, if the robot has to take a cube, uh, but uh, does not manage to take it because uh, it cannot see it. So for example, it could ask the human to see it, uh, to move it so it can, uh, it can see it. Um, a contingency can also be the human not doing uh, its action. Um, so how the robot should react uh, when the human does not uh, bear part of the, of the plan. Uh, either the robots can do uh, the parts that a human uh, should have done if it's possible, or the robots can try to negotiate to ask to the human to do, it, to do uh, their part. Uh, the human uh, may agree or may not. The human may give an explanation or not. Uh, we are not able to un we are not able to handle all kind of explanations because uh, we are not uh, working on uh, dialogue. But uh, we could have an explanation uh, such as uh, I don't want to do it. In this case, for example, the robot could just abort the plan. Uh, the supervision uses a lot of uh, communication. It can be verbal, uh, as the example I just gave, or it can be uh, non-verbal. Uh, the head moving is a communication. For example, if the robot uh, asks the human to take a given cube, uh, it could also uh, at the same time look at this cube, giving a non-verbal indication of the cube the human should take. Um, also, we work on the task that uh, we will explain uh, just after, uh, which is a robot guide. So make the use of pointing with uh, its arm, uh, which is also a nonverbal communication. Um, and uh, we took an interest on uh, how to measure if an interaction is going well or not. Uh, if the robot is able to see uh, if at some point, something is not going well, but more generally than, uh, than an action failing, the robot could uh, try to adapt. Uh, so I'm going to explain how we did to make the robots measure the quality of an interaction. Oh, uh, yes, first, uh, just uh, giving an example of um, how the robots can try to take initiative uh, to avoid being stuck. So for example, here it asks uh, the, the, no, the human asks the robot to take the green cube, but, um, uh, and there are only one cube, one green cube that the human can see. Uh, the human cannot see the green cube, which is on the top left uh, of the shelf. So the robot deduced that uh, the human was talking about the one uh, below. 
when the human asks to take the block with a triangle, however, here, uh, there were two possible cubes that the robots could take. So uh, instead of uh, being stuck and the uh, robot not doing what you should do, uh, it just adds the human thanks to the referring uh, uh, expression generator. Uh, should I take the, green uh, the cube with the green triangle or the one with the blue triangle? So now we are going to focus on the quality of interaction. Um, so this part is on how to measure it. And we are not going to, take, to talk about uh, how to use it then to make the decision. We define the quality of interaction, so QI, as a measure that indicates how good is the interaction. It is assessed at three levels, the interaction session level, the task level, and the action level. Uh, each uh, QE measure takes also into account the data of the other QE level. So for example, in the task QI, uh, we took into account uh, the action QI and also the metrics that we defined. Uh, the real-time ev evaluation process performs computations every one second. First, it gets the measurements of selected metrics. Then, with an equation that we will not describe here, uh, it computes a QI value for the ongoing action using the measurements of the metrics selecti selected for this given action. It also computes a QI value for the task based on the metrics selected for the given task and based on the action QIs previously computed at the task quality depend on the action's quality. The two output values are between minus one representing a poor quality of interaction and one representing a high quality. Uh, so the set of, of metrics we define to be able to do it um, is uh, based on metrics related to human engagement and action ev effectiveness. Uh, we define two metrics to measure the human engagement in real time. The first one uh, is the human contribution to the goal. Uh, it allows to evaluate how well the human performs during th the task. For example, does they put the right cube at the right pace at the right moment? The purpose of the second metric, fulfilling robot expectations, is to measure if the human is behaving the way the robot expects uh, when the robot is acting. So for example, when the robot speaks to the human, it will expect them to look at it. Um, then we define three metrics to measure the effectiveness in real time. The first one is the variation, uh, the variation in the distance to the goal. Uh, it measures if the agent is getting closer to its target position over time. During a normal execution, at every time step, the remaining distance should be shorter than at the previous time step. step. Uh, the second metric compares the current estimated time to the goal with the initial estimated time to the goal taking into account the current task duration. If the action is supposed to last five seconds when it starts, but after two seconds of execution, then the remaining, style, the remaining time is still five seconds, something is not going well. Finally, the last metric checks if the duration of the ongoing action or task is going over the usual time of the execution or not. Uh, so we are going to give you now uh, examples of a collaborative task. Okay, so the first example will be about the direction giving task of the robot in a shopping mall. So this was a part of the uh, EU H uh, H2020 project called the Multimodal Mall Entertainment Robot or in short MUMR. So this is done in collaboration with our partner universities with LAS focusing on the direction given task and also the integration of the entire system uh, uh, and handling different parts of the project. So, uh, so uh, what have we done in this uh, direction given task? So uh, this can also be called a, the point in task and it can be seen as like uh, a combination of both uh, guiding to the destination and also providing route directions to the destination. So normally if a customer asks to go to a specific shop or some location in the mall, 
we can either assist the customer guiding until the destination or we can also give directions like you go straight from here take a left and then take a right something like that so what we do is in pointing tasks can be seen as a trade off as i said earlier but uh, so we ground on different route we ground our sorry we ground our route description on different landmarks in the mall like uh, shops or restaurants and we try to point in a particular direction, either showing the landmark or the uh, direction to take, or even the destination in some cases. So the customer then can converse with the robot until he can understand the uh, directions properly, and then also have multiple queries before uh, they proceed to their goal. So this seems quite uh, this seems like a quite easy task, but if we go into the details of uh, real time implementation and also uh, how in a real world deployment, it's not that easy. So like we, we try to see some of the points that we might need to account in a real life, apart from uh, even having a well-designed system like we presented. So uh, the first thing we need to account is for the uh, human capabilities or preferences, like if the person can stake the stairs or he needs to use an elevator or something else. So the next thing would be the computing the best road based on the uh, preference of the customer uh, and also his position and uh, taking into consideration like the previous knowledge which is already there. So th this is the one of the not so easy ones because we have to remember everything and have the knowledge base as we described earlier. And also we have to account for the uh, visual perspective of the human, like what the human can see when the robot asks uh, is at some place, it assumes that the human will be at, at some point with the with respect to it and then tries to estimate the visuals of the human so that it can show point in a proper direction and then finally uh, give the right road description using the landmarks that it, is, that it is showing and also since it is a, a, a audio system with the plausible errors we also have to take care of the audio or visual set and it's more like auto correcting the system uh, to understand what the human might have said or have done. And then finally to point to an obstacle or to point to a, sorry, to point to a destination or to point to a landmark, the robot has to move in the environment within, within a small area, which is in the proximity of humans, which is not quite exactly we show in the lab scenario. We have to take care of the perception in the wild and also take care of lighting and different perspectives apart from navigation and also how to be uh, human aware and legible navigation. So, so finally, we also plan, try to react to some uncertain human activities or actions like uh, the human not trying, not able to understand what the robot was saying or not, or not even uh, communicating with the robot properly. Uh, so we try to address these, some of these issues. And finally, if the human is not responsive at all, does not, uh, uh, ask us to uh, does not cooperate with us we'd finally terminate the task after multiple tries. so now we'll give one more example uh, yeah for her second example we will, we will uh, introduce you a task called the direct all task it's an example that uh, that we have already used all along this presentation but here we will try to do to give you more details about it. So this task is inspired from a psychology test, test where two agents are facing each other with a shelf between them and objects object on the shelf. One of the agents is assigned to the role to the role of the director, giving instruction to retrieve objects, and the other to the role of the receiver, following the instruction. The shelf between them is composed of compartments where some are masked to the director, like uh, the one of, uh, on the image. This means that the director only sees and thus knows uh, a subset of what the receiver perceives. The goal of the director is to verbally designate objects to the receiver. However, because the director does not see all the objects in the shelf, from the receiver point of view, some description might also match objects which are not visible to the director. The receiver thus has to perform perspective taking to find the right object to take. 
In the represented, in the presented example, uh, the director might refer to the smallest candle secured in, uh, in, grid, in green uh, on his perspective on the right. However, from the receiver, the smallest candle is not the one circle in uh, is the one circle in red and not the one circle in green. The receiver thus has to infer that the director cannot know this candle and that the right one uh, should be the medium one on his perspective, so on your left. This task uh, studies uh, perspective taking and entity referring. Here is uh, here is represented how we have adapted this task to robotic application and especially for HRI uh, application. You cannot note that unlike the original task, both the director and the receiver as uh, compartments uh, and thus block, in fact, uh, only visible to them. In this way, both will uh, have to take the perspective of the author either to give instruction or to understand them. Moreover, due to the limited visual features of the blocks, here you just have the color of the block, uh, the color of the border, and a geometric shape with a color, in fact. So we have a lot of ambiguities. Uh, in this adapted task, the director has to instruct the receiver to remove from the components a set of blocks uh, and that regardless the, or the order. So the director can try to optimize his communication. With the architecture we have presented to you, how a robot is able to play both roles. Uh, and here I will show you some examples with a fully autonomous robot, first playing the role of uh, the director. You will see at the bottom left the estimations the robot makes uh, of the human perspective. Uh, so the geometric world it represents for the for the human. Can you put the green block in the green storage box? So here the robot has asked for the green block because even if it knows two, two green blocks, it had estimated that the other one is unknown from its partner. In addition, the robot has started with this block because it is simple to communicate and it allows to remove ambiguities uh, for the next ones. Now we have the robot playing the role of the receiver. So once again, here's the director, and so here's the human, has asked for the green block. The robot has analyzed the sentence and interpreted it into the human perspective. So even if it knows two green blocks, it has estimated that the human uh, knew only one of them. Uh, in the two presented example, we add a focused human, not making any mistake, but what happened if the human gave incomplete instructions? Block with a green triangle or the block with a blue triangle? With the blue triangle. I take it. Drop the block. I drop it. So here the robot has not been able to find the instructor, the instructed block and has helped the human to refine his instruction, like I presented you uh, just before. We can also note that even if the robot uh, knew, knows three blocks with a triangle, it has only proposed complementary information about the two estimated ones, the two uh, it estimates humans to know. This is the end of this presentation. Thank you for attending it. And if you have any questions, we will be we are glad to answer them.
Okay, thanks uh, to Lou's team. It was really very interesting and uh, I think most people benefited from this tutorial, very educational. Uh, we hope that we will uh, also uh, cooperate in other ways in the future. And uh, I think Amit has managed to join now. Uh, if you have uh, any questions, please continue to uh, type in the chat. I think we still have some time left. Uh, so uh, please feel free to ask questions. So if there aren't any other questions, uh, so Amit, uh, do you want to say a few words? Uh, yes, thanks. I think I, can, I, I hope I'm audible. Okay. Okay. So, and uh, I think if there is any question, perhaps uh, they can send offline and uh, I am sure last team will be happy to answer <laughs> or respond on that. So, um, so I, uh, and uh, for everyone, I hope it was a great, great listening uh, from the people uh, of a lab which is seen as pioneering lab in, in uh, the domain of uh, human robot interaction, robotics in general, social robotics, whatever we can talk about. Uh, and, and the team is always great uh, as I have been experiencing and uh, it was same today. Um, so we got very insightful uh, information and uh, knowledge about uh, what this domain of uh, human robot interaction is and uh, clearly it is very diverse as you have already seen and uh, it brings different disciplines together and the interesting aspect is that uh, how we can bring uh, psychology social science robotics all together to to create and uh, make some impactful applications of robots uh, within this uh, domain so so this is one of the messages which we can take out from, from the talk and um, all these presentations uh, from today. And especially, I think uh, now we know that uh, there are different pillars uh, of human robot interaction, including the interaction aspect, uh, navigation, manipulation, and how the robots should be planning by considering human and its own uh, constraints and abilities and uh, then how it should be behaving in different situations, uh, including the capability of uh, perspective taking and theory of minds. Uh, because uh, basically when we talk about human robot interaction, we have to understand the robot has to understand uh, that there is a human in the environment and, and how to consider the human in, in a particular manner uh, uh, for a particular situation, for a particular task. So those are the key things and the key ingredients, which I think we, we got to know today all together. And um, with this, uh, I, I should thank uh, Dr. Asid Alami, Aureli, and uh, all the team members from LAS uh, who, who, who have spent the time and shared the knowledge with uh, all of us. And hopefully in the future, we will even plan uh, uh, more events like this and uh, even different ways of collaboration which uh, which all we are discussing all together so thanks a lot again uh, the last team okay okay thanks okay, okay so Raghu, okay uh, with that i think uh, now we can end this session i just want to remind the audience that uh, the main symposium is actually tomorrow. So I would invite all of you to join. Uh, there are many talks, very interesting ones throughout the day. Uh, so um, please join the symposium tomorrow. It starts at 8.45 Indian Standard Time. Thanks again very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.